All right, so we are moving on now into the next subsection of uh, Toynbee's study of history. Now he moves on to Minoan Crete, um, or let's say back, but backwards or downwards, like an ar archaeologist to earlier strata of uh, civilization. So this is the first of the extinct societies. Toynbee's now done covering all the living societies and their fossil remnants of previous societies. And so he turns to Minoan Crete. And so he makes quite a few mistakes, I think, in, in this chapter because of his uh, trying to adhere to a schema and trying to force the facts of history to fit into his schema, and they just, they just don't do it. Um, so here's Minoan Crete. And um, notice that the, the great palace areas of Canassus in the north and Malia, uh, and then in the south, Phaestos, and then on the east, we have Zacros. Those are the four palace cities. Notice that they're all on the eastern half of the island. Um, the soil is just as good on the western half of the island as on the eastern half. So Fernand Braudel in his book, Memory in the Mediterranean, points out that this indicates an eastern affiliation, that its interests are associated not so much with the north or with Anatolia, <clears throat> but with Syria on the one hand and Egypt on the other, with, with which um, there were great trade relations. So he goes looking for the universal state for the Syriac society, which is to say the Hebrew society, as it emerges out of all of this uh, chaos at the end of the uh, late Bronze Age. It completely collapses. There's a massive systems collapse of all of these societies around around the year 1200 BC. Um, so he goes looking for a universal state, and he says, well, the universal state here is the Minoan Thalassocracy, that is to say their naval supremacy. They mastered the Aegean, the eastern half of it anyway, but there is no way in which one can maintain that this is a universal state. Um, this is a peaceful, small-scale society. Uh, there's no evidence of weapons amongst these peoples uh, until later when the Mycenaeans get there and they bring weapons with them. Um, a universal state, by definition, has a, a military. That's one of its essential components. So Toynbee's messed himself up here in trying to force this to fit into his schema of a universal state and a universal church, a Fulker Vanderung, and an interregnum. Um, there is also no universal church. There's no evidence for it whatsoever here. And you can he spends several paragraphs talking about Minoan mythology and says that it's basically a monotheism of the goddess. It is not. Uh, it is polytheistic. Uh, the scholar Carl Karenyi has pointed has written a, a treatise on Dionysus, saying that Dionysus most likely uh, originates from Crete, um, possibly also the, the triad of Demeter, Persephone, and the male god Triptolemus. Um, and he himself even points to a, a Cretan form of Zeus, uh, Zagreus. Um, so it is absolutely a polytheistic society. There is no universal state. There is no universal church here. There is, however, a Fulker Vanderung, which comes in with the invasions of the Sea Peoples who come raiding in out of the Black Sea right about the year 1200 BC, which is also the date given about 1250 for the Trojan War. And it's very likely that the Trojan War destabilized that region. Maybe there was a famine there along the shores of the Black Sea, and that sent the Sea Peoples out looking for new lands, looking for spoils and goods. Um, and let's see here, we have a, a map of the Sea Peoples here. And here they come, all these arrows with them raiding everywhere. They, they destroy everything. They completely uh, destroy the Hittite civilization in Anatolia, which is saying something because even the Egyptians were not able to defeat uh, the Hittites. Um, they defeat the, the Mycenaeans. The Dorians come along with them uh, as another wave on top of Greece. Uh, Crete is wiped out completely and finally in its, its final phase. And we should look for a second at the stages of Minoan Crete in terms of its history. It has an early Minoan, a middle Minoan, and a late Minoan period. That is to say, translating into my terminology, a pre-classic, classic, classic and post-classic period. The pre-classic period is known as the first palace period from 1900 to 1700 when they first build uh, these elegant, opulent palaces, although the Cretans have been there since about 2500 BC. So it takes them a while to get up and running to their high period. Then that period of palaces is destroyed by an earthquake. And then so they rebuild everything in the second palace period, which is their classic phase, 1700 to 1450 BC. And this is the apogee of Cretan art and culture and opulence and wealth. Absolutely spectacular achievement. It's almost completely wiped out, though, by the eruption of Thera, the island of Santorini, which erupted sometime between 1600 and 1500. 
um, and it was a huge eruption. There may be echoes of this in the in the uh, the book of Exodus, where uh, we have the the pillar of fire by night, uh, pillar of fire by night, and column of smoke by day. It may may be an echo of that. Scholars have also suspected that it may be an echo of the drowning of Atlantis, since it wiped out uh, Santorini and one of the main trading posts there with the Minoans was Akrotiri. We'll look at one of its uh, frescoes in a minute. Um, and it would have caused huge tsunamis that pretty much wiped out almost everything on Crete except for Canassos. All the other pal palaces were wiped out and would have had to have been rebuilt. And then, so, then another disaster happens when uh, shortly after that, maybe f within 50 years, the Mycenaeans decide uh, to get aggressive. Uh, and the Mycenaeans are, by contrast, a kind of barbaric uh, group living in uh, uh, fortress castles that are kind of comparable to the Franks uh, in, during the medieval era. Uh, the Franks vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, Islam, which was a sophisticated cosmopolitan civilization in the south that had influence on the Franks, such as the candy striping on the architecture at the Palace of Aachen. So too here we have a very cosmopolitan, sophisticated uh, civilization, Minoan Crete, a peaceful civilization for the most part, at least as far as I can tell. The Mycenaeans were warriors, though, and they constitute an external proletariat, though Toynbee doesn't say this, they do constitute an external proletariat vis-a-vis -vis the Minoans, whom they pretty much put the death blow to. Then we get a third palace period from 1450 to 1300, in which Crete has been completely colonized by the uh, Mycenaeans, and then a post-palace period, 1300 to 1100. Um, and then so let's go back here and look at Canassos. So this is Canassos at the apogee, uh, during the Second Palace period, a uh, very cosmopolitan, sophisticated society. Uh, these are culture builders, not th these are not empire builders. Toynbee has this completely wrong. Um, and then here's the Minoan, what he calls the Minoan Thalassocracy, which is not a Thalassocracy, but a peaceful trading uh, empire, mastering uh, the Aegean. Everyone, uh, Minoan Crete influenced everyone, including Egypt during its new kingdom, its universal state phase. Egypt most definitely at this period has just finished uh, expelling the Hyksos in uh, 1570 BC-ish and may even have conscripted Mycenaean mercenaries uh, to be carried in Cretan ships to help them uh, dispose of the Hyksos. Uh, the, the Mycenaeans would have done the job if the Egyptians couldn't have, although I suspect that that probably isn't a necessary hypothesis and probably wasn't the case. So then let's look at the the, um, the evolution of Minoan art from its early Minoan, and this is one of the vases from Vasiliki uh, from the early Minoan period. It's in the shape of a bird. This is a bird's head with its beak and its eye. So this is uh, a bird. And then another early Minoan uh, terracotta statue from Palicastro of what will later be be seen to be the the elegant lithe young men who are the bull jumpers in the middle period the classic period and then here we have um this is from the first palace period and this is the early tentative first tentative gropings toward uh what will become an art of fresco art probably second to none in the world uh there was a tremendous creative explosion that happened in minoan crete um and here the, the figures are still a bit sketchy uh, the spatial composition is still a bit awkward, so they're groping here during the first palace period. Um, but then we get the earthquake. Th those palaces are destroyed. Now there's a new period that's rebuilt where everything is even better. And here we have a vessel from uh, that time, a Kamari's Ware vessel, also in the shape of a bird, uh, the, the spout there uh, representing a bird's beak. And then here's the wonderful priest king from about 1700 BC. Um, note the, uh, the youthful appearance of these men and women, there are no old people represented in this art. Here is uh, a couple of kids boxing from Akrotiri that was one of the sites on Santorini that was wiped out by the volcanic eruption. Um, the Minoans pretty much invent the archetype of the wonder child, which is an archetype that I've pointed out, which is the central fundamental operating archetype that is common to both the Greeks and the Faustian Northern West our reverence for the new, the new, the new, our looking ahead. The child represents the future. Uh, the child and his new gadgets are going to save us. There are no beards, no bearded men in anywhere in uh, Minoan art. And uh, indeed, pretty much no one over the age of 30 appears in, in the art at all. Uh, it's all beautiful young women like this one here and men. Um, and Minoan Crete, so far as I know, is 
one of the only societies, possibly Egypt, amongst the peasants, but not amongst the, the upper, the, the classes of the nobles, had their women walk around with their breasts exposed. And this is one of the, uh, the statues, one of the early statues of the uh, snake goddess, whom Toynbee points out and says must be the primary monotheistic god of this society. She is not. She is definitely at the top of the pantheon. There's no doubt about that. Um, but there are plenty of gods and goddesses uh, along with her as well. And here's a later version, a masterpiece of the snake goddess. She has sitting on her head what appears to be, uh, from what I can make out, uh, some sort of a cat. So this may be an early version of the cat goddess. And her body may actually be emerging out of a mountain uh, at the waist there with the lower levels representing the cosmic mountain because there are sacred mountains on Crete and the mountain goddess is a, a, an almost universal archetype. You find it with Shiva's wife in India, uh, Parvati, who is a mountain goddess as well. And then we have this wonderful thing, the saffron goddess, which is an absolute masterpiece. This is beautiful griffin figure next to her. All this loving detail, lavish opulence. This isn't the old days of the Neolithic, the dark, gloomy days of Neolithic Chattelhoyak and those underworld sites with their vultures carrying away the skulls of the dead. Uh, and that art was an art of the underworld, sacred to the ancestors. Uh, Minoan Crete is already turning its back on the cult of the ancestors. They buried their dead in separate cemeteries for the first time in the West that were out beyond uh, well out away from the city. They're turning their backs on the dead. This is the cult of the new, the youthful, the strong, the sexy, uh, the opulent, the beautiful. This Very Greek in many, many ways, but without the militarism. So what happens is that they get the militarism from the primitive, crude, barbaric Mycenaeans who invade them, and we get a fusion of two separate cultures. I'm, I'm very surprised Toyn Toynbee doesn't see this that we get the, the aggressive, masculine, patriarchal Mycenaeans uh, going to war against the, the feminine, goddess-worshipping Minoans, but from the fusion of the two of them, we get Greek civilization. So they are both parents, in an almost literal sense of a, of a father and a mother, of the apparented, they are the apparented society together synthesized of their affiliated uh, offspring, the Hellenic. Toynbee misses all of that. And then... Um, Here's an elegant little thing, this ivory bull jumper um, carved uh, out of ivory. Um, you can almost see the bull, uh, see these guys leaping over bulls. They did not kill bulls. They, they had a game of jumping over them. And here's another fresco masterpiece, Ladies in Blue. Uh, looks like something that could be uh, from the modernist art period in Europe. Um, and it may be a prototype of the triple goddess, the three graces uh, that later appears in... Uh, Greek art, and here's, uh, this is the art at its apogee. Here are those bull jumpers. We saw the ivory sculpture of the guy jumping over, and it may meant to move, be, be meant to move from left to right with the guy getting ready to jump, the male guy jumping over it, and the other guy having landed. Um, possibly it's meant to, to connote that. An absolute masterpiece. This is Cretan art at its finest, and this beautiful uh, steatite of bull's head right on, where it's meant to be a libation vessel for pouring probably wine. Uh, wine is associated with the cult of the bull, and um, it would come out of the bull's mouth, and you would lean it over a cup uh, as though the wine were coming out of the bull. So I'm pretty certain that the cult of... Carl Crania is right, that the cult of Dionysus did come from the island world of, of Crete. Um, and then here the art is beginning to decline. This is the, the later period, the third palace period, where uh, the, the, there's something that is definitely being lost here in this... Uh, now we're moving into the uh, the late period, the post-classic period with the Mycenaean invasions. And so here is uh, Mycenae. And as you can see, um, it's fortified with walls. None of the Cretan cities have walls. They're not fortified with walls because they, they weren't worried about anyone bothering them. They had the privilege of isolation on an island, uh, but they weren't militarists at all. The Mycenaeans were. This looks like a fortress castle that would be right at home in medieval Europe. Um, <clears throat> And they have, uh, initially around 1500 BC, they have these grave circles. This is about 1550, where they're burying their dead in these pit graves, <clears throat> also known as shaft graves, uh, in these grave circles within the walls of their compound. Notice that the Minoans have already separated their dead to the periphery. The Mycenaeans are still revering their ancestral warrior deads from this ancient uh, Indo-European uh, sort of death cult. And then um, found in one of these graves was what was called the Mask of Agamemnon. It, it is, of course, way too early for that, 1500. But notice the beard. 
the, the Mycenaeans depict their warriors with, with grizzled beards. Um, they don't have the archetype of the wonder child yet. They have the militarism, but they don't have the wonder child. Um, so those two will fuse together to produce Hellenic society. And then here is one of their frescoes, <clears throat> which is by comparison with the, the frescoes that we saw at Canassus, just, just isn't very good, frankly. <clears throat> um, and then uh, here we have the, uh, the palace of Nestor uh, at Pylos. Um, it's a bit stiff. Uh, in, instead of the courtyard that we find in the palace cities like uh, Canassos, where they have a central courtyard, here we, instead we have what's called the Megaron, which is where the central fire goes, with surrounded by four pillars, and the smoke simply goes up uh, the, not a chimney exactly, but an open air rectangle there. Um, and the art just isn't that good. This, these, and they're, it's entirely, they wouldn't even have art if the Minoans didn't exist. It's entirely imported from the world of the Minoans and copied, uh, though nowhere nearly, with the same uh, level of elegance and sophistication. This is the so-called throne room from later on uh, at Canassos now, not in Mycenae, but it's most likely, <clears throat> this is from the period of the Mycenaean invasions, when they've taken over Canassos and have installed a throne room here. Also, the art with the griffins there is very stiff compared to that wonderful griffin that we saw with the saffron lady, uh, which was quite amazingly lyrical and elegant. Um, and here we have the treasury of Atreus. So what they do is they change their burial style practices to these tholoi, uh, these tholos tombs, which they have imported Cretan master craftsmen to come over and design for them. This is about 1250 BC. And this is probably where the myth of Daedalus as a master craftsman, a, a master builder comes from, from the Cretan engineers and architects who could design these. You have a central dromos uh, opening there through which the individual would go inside to worship the dead, and you would be able to see the dead body of the warrior uh, <clears throat> and all of his goods and implements and weapons around him. Now, as Ervin Rhoda, Nietzsche's friend, points out in his book Psyche, when he's analyzing uh, the evolution of Greek myth, points out this means that these warriors uh, had a strong belief in the afterlife and that they would need those weapons in the afterlife on the other side. So this isn't yet Homer's world. This is still an warrior ancestor worship. It's not yet Homer's world of, of the darkening of Hades, uh, where we find these ineffectual twittering shades like Achilles, whom Odysseus encounters down there in the Odyssey, who has who's totally ineffectual. He's just a shadow of his former self. A darkening has happened because, along with the Sea Peoples, the Dorians have come in uh, on top of the Mycenaeans, and they lay down the foundations um, for Greek culture, and they bring with them the cult of the burning of the dead. So when they're burning the dead, they're cutting the ties to the underworld. They're cutting the ties to Hades. And so the Greeks, just like the Minoans, are turning their back, their backs on the cult and culture and worship of the ancestral dead. Uh, those days are gone now, and the age of the wonder child is now on the scene. And so here we have the entrance to that Tholos tomb, uh, which is rather vaginal. I think that it's intended to be vaginal and that there's an, an intended to, uh, to be an analogy with a pregnant belly, uh, womb to tomb. Uh, the warrior, once he is put inside, will sort of becomes an embryo. He will be reborn uh, as a new warrior after his passage uh, through Hades, uh, through the underworld. And then so what happens is that the Sea Peoples, we're, we're back full circle here with the Sea Peoples, about 1200 BC, who come raiding in over all of this. The Dorians are not a Sea People, but they're, uh, they come raiding in onto the peninsula, the Balkan Peninsula, at just about the same time as the Sea Peoples do. And so Tynbe then, he's talking about um, the Minoans being uh, the universal state, with the Sea Peoples being the Volker Vandering, and from out of that, the Syriac society is affiliated to the Minoans, which is completely ridiculous. The Minoans have nothing to do with the Syriac society of the Hebrews. And he says, one would be tempted to find the universal state that gave rise to the, uh, the, the Hebrews in the universal state of Egypt. He's absolutely correct here, though he mentions it and brushes it under the rug, that the universal state was that of the New Kingdom Empire, which comes in around uh, with the expulsion of the Hyksos, about 1580 or 75 BC and lasts for uh, down to the invasions of the Sea Peoples when then it shifts after Ramses III does a battle with them and situates them. He has to grant them land in Palestine. In fact, Palestine is named after one of them, the tribe of the Peliset. Um, and so there is a folk of wandering there. But I would say that the universal church there was abortive in this case. Toynbee doesn't notice this. 
that the Pharaoh Akhenaten, who did found monotheism, just as Freud said in his book Moses and Monotheism, uh, would have been its prophet. And he was trying to eliminate all the funerary cults. He himself is already turning his back on the dead at about the same time as the Minoans are and the Dorians, all turning their backs on the cult of the dead. And there was an abortive universal state in his case that was wiped out since the Egyptians thought that it was an abomination and it only lasted for 13 years. And then the, the other, so Moses would have been the key character there. And the two characters that show the dual affiliation of the Syriac society are, of course, Abraham and Moses. Abraham is the linkage of the affiliation to the Sumerians. He was living in the Sumerian city of Ur about 1700 or 1800 BC, and he leaves from there. That's the northern affiliation to Mesopotamia and the southern affiliation via Moses to uh, Ignaton and the Egyptians. So that's the dual uh, affiliation in that case. Toynbee misses all of that, astonishingly. I, I don't understand how he goes wrong in the way that he goes about. He does this thing where he synthesizes where he should analyze these societies and analyzes them, breaks them apart where he should synthesize them. Um, but he, is, he has a lot of interest, interesting ideas to, to think about. So we have the birth of the Hellenic, two civilizations coming out of this Fulker Vandrum. The Hellenic civilization on the one hand, out of the fusion that is analogous to the fusion in India, of the peaceful Indus Valley Society, which is exactly contemporary with Minoan Crete, 2600 BC down to about 1500 BC. And in that case, we have Indo-Aryan militarists, the Vedic Aryans coming down, and they're too fusing together with that, that civilization, which did not have a universal state. But you could argue that it, the Indus Valley did have a universal church, which was yoga. We're pretty certain that yoga comes from the Indus Valley, although the Vedic Aryans don't pick it up for a very long time, from 1500 BC till its appearance in the earliest of the Upanishads, 800 BC, with Yujan of Valkya, who who's, uh, teaches it to the Brahmins. So there, there too, in both of these cases, in the second generation of civilization, which is the Chinese, the Indians, the Persians, uh, the Jews, and the Greeks, that all is tantamount to the second generation, the Minoans, and the Indus Valley are left over from the first generation, which has to do, which consists of the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, and then their satellites, the Harappan or Indus Valley Dravidian civilization, and the Minoans on the other hand. So the Minoan society is a kind of chrysalis by means of which the Hellenic society comes into being. It has nothing to do with Syriac society. Tony B at one point even makes the absurd suggestion that the Minoans invented the alphabet. Uh, they absolutely did not. That was either an invention of the Hebrews in the Sinai Peninsula, as evidence indicates from uh, inscriptions in uh, Egyptian turquoise mines in the Sinai where they were employing Hebrew slave labor, and we find the earliest evidence of the alphabet there. Uh, so it most likely comes from the Hebrews, although tradition ascribes it. The Greeks said that Cadmus, King Cadmus, brought it over from the Phoenicians and introduced it into Greece. Either way, um, it doesn't come from the Minoans, whose earliest writing, anyway, we, has never been deciphered and probably never will be. Um, all right, so that brings us up to date with that section uh, in Toynbee's uh, study of history. Next, we'll look at the Sumerians.